If people using literally, non-literally really gets your goat, you might be surprised at the number of words you use yourself that now have very different meanings from the ones they started with. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, your friendly guide to the English language. Stick around because after we talk about a bunch of words with surprising etymologies, we're going to talk about whether the word pre-order is redundant, and we'll end with a familect story that made me laugh out loud. Here's our first word with a surprising history, bully. In modern English, this word is far from what we'd call a term of endearment. Instead, a bully, a person who harasses and intimidates others, has become the subject of widespread anti-bullying campaigns at schools and workplaces. But in a very unexpected twist, earlier in our history, a bully was a lover, not a fighter. The word bully appears to have come into English from the Middle Dutch word bol, B-O-E-L, meaning lover of all things. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the earliest citation for the English word bully is from a comedy written by John Bale around 1548, where he describes a woman as mine own sweet bully, followed by a reference to her pretty face. In this period, bully was a term like dear or sweetheart and could refer to anyone. The word soon grew to be mainly a term used among men along the lines of a friendly bro, one would say to his figurative brother. You can find an example of this in Shakespeare's play A Midsummer Night's Dream, where Peter Quince says to his fellow performer Nick Bottom, "'What sayest thou, bully bottom?' But by the 17th century, bullies started to refer to people full of swagger or bluster, particularly groups of rowdy young men trolling the streets of London. From this, we seem to get the modern meaning of one who acts aggressively and hassles others. When a word moves from a positive meaning to a more negative meaning like this, linguists call it semantic pejoration, from the same root as the word pejorative. On the opposite end of the spectrum from bully is the word nice, a word which, it turns out, wasn't always so, well, nice. Arriving in English alongside William the Conqueror in the form of Anglo-Norman French, the word first meant silly, foolish, or ignorant, with this sense going all the way back to its Latin form, nesus, which also meant ignorant. This earlier meaning is clear in this quote from the History of the Holy Grail from 1450. They said he was a fool, and that they seen never so nice a man, meaning they had never seen so ignorant a man. Even more surprising given its contemporary sense, we see early examples of nice being used to describe a person or behavior considered lascivious or immoral, as in this use from a 17th century text. What nice and wanton appetites. It's not until the next century that nice gets nicer, in other words, used to talk about an agreeable or pleasant thing or person. So how did nice so drastically improve its station? Well, by 1400, we also find nice used to refer to someone who was finely dressed, often in a showy sense, and perhaps a bit of a well-dressed fool. But as time went on, this use of nice took on an association with refinement and culture. By the 1500s, it seems to have taken on a more positive spin and an association with good breeding, as we see in this quote from a report describing the life and people of Virginia in 1588. Some were also of a nice upbringing. By the 1700s, nice had turned its reputation fully around. For example, Jane Austen used it in a letter dated 1799, where she talks about a nice woman, meaning a respectable and virtuous woman. As opposed to pejoration like bully, when a word's meaning becomes more negative over time, nice had what linguists call semantic amelioration or improvement over time. As an interesting aside, although nice and silly would seem to have had much in common given nice's early meaning, silly, the original form of silly, actually meant happy, pious, or innocent when it first arrived in English, and so had a better reputation than nice in its early days. 
It shifted to its more negative sense by 1500, having taken on the aspect of happy innocence that could be taken as weakness or simpleness. Next, I'm guessing that the image that comes to mind when you hear the word bimbo is more likely than not an attractive ditzy female. But the word bimbo actually started out as a riff on the Italian word bimbo, meaning male child. And when it first gained traction in English as a slang term, it was used to describe men, not women. In fact, the Oxford English Dictionary defines the word's earliest meaning as a man, a fellow, a guy, often one who is stupid, inept, or objectionable. Giving this early example, which refers to a man, from American Magazine. Nothing but the most heroic measures will save the poor bimbo. Very shortly thereafter, though, we find it used to describe an attractive woman, first seeing it in the 1920s song My Little Bimbo Down on Bamboo Isle, about a sailor's female mistress. It's used in a more pejorative sense, referring to a sexualized, pretty, but unintelligent woman, seems to have taken off around the mid-1970s, and it's during this period that Google Engrams shows a big uptick in written use. The shift in its meaning toward mainly women is further supported in the development of the later term himbo to refer to male bimbos, which first shows up in writing from the 1980s. Moving on, the next time your procrastinating friend tells you they're going to do something soon, you can call them out on not getting around to it quickly enough, because it turns out the word soon carried a sense of immediately or without delay in its earliest use. In fact, we still see traces of this meaning in the as-soon-as construction, which suggests that action will occur immediately after some other action is completed, as in Squiggly will go on a diet as soon as he eats that last piece of cake. It appears that the more modern meaning, shortly, developed around the 12th century, and because it was hard to be much quicker than immediately, a comparative form, sooner, didn't appear until around the 13th century, finally allowing us to be a bit more or less soon to arrive. And soon isn't the only temporal term that's been shifting over the centuries. The Shakespearean-sounding anon, which carried the meaning of soon or ready in his day, also originally meant at once. For example, in early Middle English, he went anon meant he went at once. Both soon and anon shifted away from their original meanings likely because the sense of immediacy weakened over time when people intended its immediacy to be understood relative to some other time. After eating cake, Squiggly went soon to bed. In other words, right to bed. Or it was used a bit loosely by those who uh, tend toward procrastination. In other words, human nature being what it is, people happily took advantage of a little wiggle room in how soon exactly soon had to be. Next, in modern parlance, to run amok means to be wildly out of control. But what's most interesting about this word is not so much a meaning change over time, but where the word originates. The word came from the Malay words amok or mangamuk both of which describe being in a state of frenzied, murderous rage. In the 16th century, we see the word amochi or amoku used by European sailors to describe fierce Javanese warriors who pledged to die fighting. Other accounts, such as that of British explorer Captain James Cook in the 18th century, claimed amok was the result of a bad opium trip. But according to Malay cultural beliefs, a muck was caused by possession from an evil tiger spirit known as Hantu Balian, which overtook a person and made them behave uncontrollably and violently. Although a muck was viewed as tied only to quote-unquote exotic cultures, biased by beliefs of early European cultural superiority, the term is very similar in meaning to the word berserk also borrowed into English, but this time from a European source. In Old Norse, a berserker was a battle-crazed warrior who fought uncontrollably and furiously. 
Both terms, of course, have shifted to a more figurative meaning in modern English, used to describe wild or uncontrolled behavior, minus the murderous streak, as in, the kids have run amok and are driving me berserk. And as a final side note, if you're curious about more words English has borrowed from Malay, look no further than bamboo, gingham, orangutan, and cooties from kutu, the name of a parasitic insect. That segment was written by Valerie Friedland, a professor of linguistics at the University of Nevada in Reno and the author of Like Literally Dude, Arguing for the Good in Bad English. You can find her at ValerieFriedland.com. My tip a day book, The Grammar Daily, is coming out November 14th, and I'm so excited. I think you're going to love it, and I'm currently encouraging people to pre order it. And I know I'll get the same comments I always get when I encourage you to pre order other people's books that the word pre order is redundant because you can really only order something. That when I click the buy button, I'm ordering, not doing some kind of pre action that comes before ordering. And I completely understand what people mean, I do, but pre-order has a different meaning in the publishing world. It specifically means to order a book before its publication date. And besides writing a review, pre-ordering a book is one of the best things you can do to help your author friends, because bookstores look at how many pre-orders a book has when they're deciding how many books to order for their stores, or even whether to order books at all. Pre-orders can also help a book get on bestseller lists because all those orders that come in during the pre-order period get tallied the week the book is launched, and the bestseller lists are based on how many books you sell in one week. So if you have 5,000 pre-orders, and then the week the book is actually launched, you sell another 1,000 books, the sales for that first week are counted as 6,000, not 1,000. And that could make the difference between getting on a bestseller list or not. The word pre-order goes all the way back to the 1600s, too. And the Oxford English Dictionary shows that the first modern use to mean ordering something in advance is 1937. I've only heard the word pre-order in a publishing context, but all the citations in the OED are about other things. For example, that 1937 citation talks about pre-ordering furniture for a house that's being built. And my editor tells me pre-ordering is a thing for video games, too. You can write pre-order with or without a hyphen. The OED uses a hyphen, but the Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary and Webster's New World College Dictionary both list both forms with the unhyphenated version first. And although pre-order isn't logical, English isn't always logical, and pre-order has developed a specific meaning, ordering something in advance. And if you have friends who are authors and you want to support them, go pre-order their books. And if you're a reviewer, you can get a review copy of The Grammar Daily from NetGalley right now. Finally, I have a family story. Hi, Grammar Girl. This is Kathy. First of all, I just want to thank you. I love your podcast. Sometimes people say, why is grammar so important? But I feel that if you are mindful about what you say and how you say it, then you will become mindful about what you do and how you do it. And that's just a short step from being mindful about how you treat other people. So I just um, thank you for doing your part in making the world a better place. I have a family story. When I started, when I was just a young director starting my career in Atlanta, um, my parents came up to watch uh, a broadcast, a news broadcast, and they to see their daughter do her job in the control room. So as you can imagine, during any life, news broadcast, things get a little intense in the control room and words tend to fly pretty um, freely (laughs) around the room. And at first, my mother sat there quietly and just sat through it. But when one particularly intense uh, curse word flew from her daughter's mouth, 
my proper southern mother let out a gasp. And so the um, technician leaned over and said, don't worry, Mrs. Bowen, that's just short for shift to the high intensity transmitter. And so from that point on, anytime we needed to uh, let our feelings be known freely, we would shout, including my mother would say, shift to the high intensity transmitter. And it's very effective. It's a very useful <laughs> phrase. I will admit, though, that I continued to use the abbreviated version in the control room. Thank you again, and love your show. <laughs> I absolutely laughed out loud, Kathy. What a wonderful story. Thank you for the call. If you want to share the story of your family, your family dialect, the word your family and only your family uses, call the voicemail line at 833214girl. It's in the show notes and be sure to tell me the story behind your family act because that's always the best part. Grammar Girl is a quick and dirty tips podcast. Thanks to our audio engineer Nathan Sims and our director of podcasts Adam Cecil. Thanks also to our ad operations specialist, Morgan Christensen, our digital operations specialist, Holly Hutchings, and our marketing associate, Davina Tomlin, who's trying to learn more about visible mending. And I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. That's all. Thanks for listening.